know, you're either all in or you're in the way. And that's something that we have subscribed to for a lot of years in this program. And being all in, I mean, that's all in in every area, not just football, but everything, you know, starting with your academics. You know, we have a one of the best academic progress rates in the country. Uh, we're in the top one percentile. Graduation rate is best in the Pac-12. So our players are really buying into it. But what we do is we try to develop the whole player here at Utah, academics, socially, uh, giving back to the community, of course, football is involved in that as well. But just being a complete person, going out of your way to demonstrate your gratitude. That's another big word in our culture is gratitude. Be active in the community and give back. Welcome to Bold Breakthroughs. I'm excited to present to you today highlights from an interview I did earlier with Kyle Whittingham, the pre-pandemic national coach of the year at the highest level of college football, the FBS. Also, Utah football's breakout leader for the past couple of decades. The reason I'm so excited to share this with you is I've heard for years as I've watched Kyle, trust the process, he says. When he brings a new recruit on, he looks in their eyes and he says, trust the process. Kyle believes in process. And it's helped him win multiple conference division titles and amass a huge number of wins with a high percentage. In fact, if you look at anyone that is an active coach within that conference, they haven't even come close to the number of wins. And he's truly become an elite individual development expert with his staff. He hires the best, he ensures that individual development, and that's been very interesting to me as someone trying to improve my own work. I knew some of those things would apply, but I had no idea how well. So I wonder, what is this process? But there's also a second reason that I become curious about this process and wanting to learn more about it. And that's when a few years ago I read a financial journalist article saying, quite cynically, you innovation and leadership experts, please stop researching, writing, speaking, and trying to apply strategy and execution from sports and military and cooking and other fields like art. We're in business. Bring us just business principles. And I had just been coming off one of my several studies of international work and leadership results. And in this particular study, we examined 2 million cases of award-winning work. And it became a national a New York Times bestseller. And we had investigated so many businesses and the variety of the types of businesses that exist out there echoes the thoughts that you've often had. Like, I can't believe all the different ways people make a living. Well, it's true. The variety of ways that we work and offer value all point to some of the most essential values and needs that we have as human beings. But the variety is staggering. And if you don't think a billion dollar art dealer <laughs> thinks he's in business, you're crazy. If you don't think that that turnaround aircraft carrier captain that took the bottom ship to the top of the Navy fleet, thought he was doing serious business and serious leadership, you're crazy. His cubes look different, his offices look different, but he was doing real leadership in very similar ways. So as you listen to Kyle describe not one team, but his 50 sub-teams. I want you to keep in mind as you listen to his hundreds of players that he leads and consider what he doesn't say explicitly. That nearly half of those people do not play football. Think about that. He, he leads hundreds of people. Nearly half don't play football. What do they do? Very business functions very typical jobs that are necessary for the program to succeed and survive financially within a larger ecosystem especially. And so the brevity of college football creates this turnover. So not only is he trying to manage 50 teams and hundreds of people doing football and all these other business practices, 
he is trying to do so with tremendous turnover that is much greater than even a financial institution like the journalist may come from. So in the midst of that, what has he done? Well, as I mentioned earlier, he won the pre-pandemic Dodd Coach of the Year. And the criteria for the Dodd Coach of the Year, well, I interviewed them as well. And what they said is we look at really three important things and a couple other things. We care about all those wins on the field, for sure. But we consider those also in light by adding the academic excellence and real achievement that can be demonstrated and proven. And based on the criteria that we see of service and leadership in their own community, we grade that team on service and leadership in the community. So Kyle's leading more than football. He's leading business and in serious business. And so we'll start with the strategy and we'll hear how they execute it and hear the individuality of his approach. So as a fanatic, we have a different job than his. Fan is short for fanatic and I'm a fanatic about football, I admit it. And a fanatic only cares about those four hours on Saturday. And that second four hours, the, the championship happens to Arian. Those are really the only two moments we care about. But think about the job Kyle has to do. Besides all that we've described, his job is to provide anticipation and excitement between Saturdays to win almost every game. So we believe that we're going to something exciting and anticipate it all week long. Plus, it's not about just one year for him. It's about building an elite program over many, many, several years, at least when you're in his role. And so he has to build a program and have a process, and his process works so well. As he describes his key elements, I want you to take away one more thing for your own personal benefit. The coach Whittingham knows that we can't have a cookie cutter approach. And he doesn't say this explicitly, but you will hear him say and demand that his individuals contribute to the larger strategy. They build the larger strategy, all of them. And he demands that the individual take a personal contribution and turn it into also their own personal process for development and improvement each week. And so as you listen to his ideas, Realize that most employees think that strategy, the first part of process, is just the top leader's responsibility. And those people never win awards. And they never, almost never, produce exceptional results. But the employees that come in to my meetings and office and say, we contribute to the company strategy. In fact, I've got my own strategy within it that fits and aligns with that path that we're pursuing. And those people often win awards. And so this information that you're about to hear is perfect for your work and your leadership. Listen to the structure. Replace football with whatever it is that you do. But take that process and how they execute it and use it to its full extent. It's an amazing process. So let's get to it. Now, in a moment, one of the elite leaders of millennials success in the entire United States. Coming up soon, Kyle Whittingham. Welcome to Bold Breakthroughs that unstick work and life. I'm Mark Cook, New York Times bestselling innovator. Each week I offer keynotes that engage thousands, and teams embed me weekly to unstick tech pivots, sales prospects, and ops constraints. We roll up our sleeves in small groups to create breakthroughs on top priorities for each individual, in person or via Zoom. Nine global studies of over two million successes fueled my 4,000 wins at top brands. I've shared rapid innovation in over 50 cities worldwide. Teams create revenue breakthroughs and clients see new profits. Thank you for listening and inspiring your breakthrough today. Strategy is plotting a path towards a specific outcome. And if that destination and those milestones along the way aren't clear, teams don't get very far. College football is big business and it is obsessed with strategy. 
And the National Dodd Coach of the Year, Kyle Whittingham of the University of Utah, knows strategy. So we're going to talk to Coach Witt today about how he executes strategy. We're going to join him on a call now. Hello, Coach Witt. How are you today? I'm doing good, Mark. How are you doing? I'd like to start with who you lead, who you serve, and why. How many millennials do you lead on that team? You know, there's about 120 players. How many total people do you lead? Probably in the neighborhood of 200. Coach, I want to give the listeners a sense of the magnitude of this strategy job. So could you tell us who the smaller teams are and how many there are? Wow. Well, you got the football team, the coaches are a team, the video department, the training room, the equipment room, the recruiting department, the operations department, the player development department, the cafeteria. There's nine or ten easily teams that uh, we got going here. If you're going to go down and, and drill down, you could say there's maybe 50 different teams. Coach, you have a lot of stakeholders. You got the players, you have the families, you have the school, you have the conference, you have the fans, you have the city. Who do you tell your players are your primary customer? How do you talk about them? Without the fans and their support, there really is no games. It's what it's all about. Uh, to have that kind of support in the community and have the community rally around you, you know, show up and watch you play, I mean, that's big. And I tell our guys all the time, don't ever take that for granted. Anytime we have a chance to give back, do that. Coach, fans are people too with their 12 primary needs and you inspire fitness, you inspire camaraderie, you inspire education, you give us an exciting entertainment every week, you even give us a little rest and recovery from the stress of life. Tell me how you talk to your players about what your primary purpose is and how to think about the fans. To be very appreciative for them, first of all, we're in the entertainment business, that's the bottom line. We're, we're entertainers and tell our guys all the time we've been fortunate enough to have 60 some odd straight sellouts. It goes back, you know, nine or 10 years. And I tell our guys all the time, you know, very few schools have that. Coach, a leader of any organization has to have a clear vision. It can't be vague. It's got to be five years out. It's just beyond the horizon. It's a specific scene that you can put in the minds of everyone who follows you. I know it would be easy to say that you have a vision of being in the college football playoffs. Talk to us about the path just before that and what you see. Well, in a broad stroke, is to become the best program we possibly can, and that's to reach an elite level. It's something that we talk about each year. You know, each team wants to become the best football team that they're capable of becoming. Coach, a lot of organizations put a mission statement behind the receptionist. They print it out on pieces of paper and hand it out and think that's going to be enough. A mission statement should be shorter term than a vision. It should be a couple of years, maybe even one. It should be a concrete accomplishment that we either succeed at or we fail at. An easy example for you would be to win the conference championship. Talk about how the process is of setting that annual target for your team. We set the team goals coming out of spring ball, what we want to accomplish as a team. It's so important. Everyone's got to be out bought in. That means getting the most out of everybody in the program, every coach, every player, manager, trainer, videographer, you know, you name it. Everybody's got to be pulling in the same direction. Coach, do you involve everyone on your teams in formulating this mission or this annual target? Absolutely. We pass out note cards and, and pencils and they all write down goals. You know, after I've collected all the goals from each of the players, we, we tally them all up and the top five, six, seven goals are mentioned the most. We adopt those as our team goals for that year. Coach, I know you don't believe that culture is a bunch of fun and parties. It's not just how we treat each other. Isn't culture the camaraderie that happens as we pursue the path and that objective together? Absolutely. To me, culture is the starting point for everything. If you've got a strong culture and everybody understands what that culture is and what's expected, you've got a great start to what you're doing. And then the coaches and the people in charge demand that everybody live up to those expectations. Go now for a minute down to the smaller team level, the sub-team. Who leads those smaller teams? Tell me about that. First of all, I put a great deal of the onus on the assistant coaches. They have the team goals minimum of twice a week that we refer to them during the season, all season long. And each coach has got to be completely responsible for every player in his position group. And that's socially, that's athletically, that's academically. And uh, we need to know everything about those players. We need to know you know, who they live with, who they have a girlfriend, everything about their family, uh, everything that's going on academically. I mean, it's, it's a, a complete, totally consuming job monitoring and managing 
uh, each player in your position group. And so that's paramount in our program for a football team. It's not like, you know, there's some sports where the head coach could probably do it all, you know, where you have maybe 10 or 12 or 15 athletes. But when you're talking 120, 125 athletes, as a head coach, you've got to delegate and put a lot of that responsibility on your assistant coaches. Otherwise, uh, it, it just won't work. Coach, I know you believe that we were all born to lead. So tell me a little bit about the players in those smaller teams, how they participate. First of all, I think that's absolutely uh, a must. I've never been around a great football team that did not have great leadership and governing from within. The players have got to take ownership. And we stress that uh, constantly. We harp on that. Players uh, stepping up and taking charge, the leaders, you know, the, it doesn't just have to be the captains, you know, the seniors, the upperclassmen. But there's got to be complete buy in and ownership by the players to reach an elite level. Uh, and if you don't have that, you know, there's an old saying in football that uh, on bad teams, nobody leads. Average teams, the coaches lead. And on great teams, the players lead. And that's, that's uh, absolutely a fact. And I've been in this profession a lot of years. And I'm um, going to tell you, the, the more leadership and the more and the, the higher quality of leadership that you have from your players is going to dictate your success. I mean, that's just, uh, that's just how it is. Okay, Coach, let's go down to the individual level. Now, I understand that when you execute strategy, you go way beyond the individual performance evaluation. Tell me how often you coach goals. Okay, good question. That's another key component to being successful is having your coaches and players have goals as part of our process. We set goals every year. We have a team meeting and the players sit down. Now, prior to that, the team goals have already been set, what we want to accomplish as a team. Then I put that in front of them the, the first day back in fall camp. We pass out note cards and, and pencils, and they all write down their individual goals. That's when we break it down and, and have each player write down his individual goals. Now, we don't collect those. That's for them to have and them to refer to, and they're fluid. I tell them all the time, you know, these goals are not set in stone. You know, you can modify your goals as the season goes on, as, as circumstances change. And I sit down with the coaches each year as well, and I have a, a review and, and let them know in my estimation where they are as a coach and what the next step is they need to take to, to become a better coach and go from a position coach to a coordinator, a coordinator to a head coach, you know, just continuing to move up the ladder. And so we do it not only with the players, but I do it with the coaches as well. So how often do you coach up those individual goals? A minimum of twice a week. When we come in on Monday after the Saturday game, we, we give the players Sunday off. We'll come in on Monday and we'll go have a team meeting and we'll go over our goals, you know, our team goals, what we did or didn't do towards that end in the previous game and how that affects the goals. We have a meeting before each game on Saturdays or whatever day the game is, and we uh, remind them about their personal goals and, and to uh, revisit those and keep them in front of them. And, and if you need to modify them or change them, and then we also at that time put up the team goals again. So they have the team goals minimum of twice a week that refer to them during the season, all season long. And then the personal goals as well, twice a week, uh, making sure they continue to keep those on point for uh, trying to accomplish those goals. What types of goals are they, and how do you tell the players to view them? You know, you're either all in or you're in the way, and that's something that we have subscribed to for a lot of years in this program. And being all in, I mean, that's all in in every area, not just football, but everything, you know, and starting with your academics. You know, we have a one of the best academic progress rates in the country. Uh, we're in the top one percentile. Graduation rate is best in the Pac-12, so our players are really buying into it. But what we do is we try to develop the whole player here at Utah, academics, socially, uh, giving back to the community, of course, football is involved in that as well. But just being a complete person, going out of your way to demonstrate your gratitude that's another big word in our culture is gratitude. Be active in the community and give back. Coach, what a great example of setting strategy and executing you are. What a great outline to set a vision, to know what your purpose is, to accomplish missions, to have teams set objectives together with players helping to lead, co-leading, and setting individual goals that are set twice a week and reviewed twice a week and accomplished hopefully twice a week. Thank you so much for your time. Hope it helped you a little. I really benefited from it, and I'm sure our listeners will too. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you have absorbed Coach Whittingham's process for your own work like I have. Vince Lombardi himself once said, perfection is not attainable, but if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. Thank you, Kyle. Now it's time for us to go. 
follow your example and create those breakthroughs. And let's meet all together once we've done so. Have a great day. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And if you enjoyed it, please share this episode with a friend that needs a breakthrough. Post this on social media and add my website, tag my YouTube page, or just text markspencercook.com to a friend or message that link on Instagram right now. Also, make sure to subscribe on my site at markspencercook.com to stay up to date on all the latest advice on how to unstick priorities to create breakthroughs. I'm so grateful that you listened today. And remember, you have people rooting for you. They love you and want you to make your breakthrough. That includes us too. Take the first step. Now, you know what time it is. It's time to go create a breakthrough for your work in life. And we'll see you there.